Chapter 23, Tactics During World War II During most of the period between World War I and World War II, the world capitalist economy was in a state of collapse. World industrial production grew at a very slow pace, and world trade remained stagnant. In fact, total world trade in 1948, three years after the end of World War II, was the same as that in 1913, the year before World War I started. The worst phase was what was called the Great Depression of 1929 through 1933, from which capitalism did not really recover, even up to the start of World War II in 1939. It was a crisis that affected practically the whole world, from the most industrialized to the most backward. Industrial production fell and unemployment reached the highest levels ever. In Germany, almost half the working class remained unemployed. Prices crashed, affecting the economies of almost every country. As economic hardships increased, contradictions sharpened and there was widespread social and political unrest in many countries. In Latin America, there were attempts to overthrow the government in almost all the countries, many of which were successful. There was also an upsurge in the independence movements in many countries, including India. Thus, throughout colonies and semi-colonies, there were struggles and a shift towards the left. In the imperialist countries, the ruling classes tried desperately to control the social effects of their crisis. Some of them introduced social welfare schemes to divert the masses from struggle. Most of the ruling classes, however, used repressive means to suppress the people. Many countries brought in rightist and fascist regimes. Italy was the first to turn to fascism. Japan shifted from a liberal to a national militarist regime in 1930 through 31. Germany brought the Nazis to power in 1933. In many other imperialist countries, there also was a rise of rightist parties and a retreat of the reformist parties. The Communist International analyzed this growth of fascism. It showed how three factors in the post-World War I situation had affected the imperialist classes and was leading to the rise of fascism. First, the success of the October Revolution and the victory of socialism had made the bourgeoisie fearful of the advance of the proletariat and the success of the revolution in their own countries. Second, they were facing the most severe economic crisis in the history of capitalism. Third, the first two factors were making the toiling masses throughout the world turn towards revolution. The response of the imperialist ruling classes to all these three factors was to bring in fascism. At the 7th Congress of the Common Turn, which was held in 1935, fascism and the danger of war were analyzed in detail. Fascism was defined as the open, terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, the most chauvinist, and the most imperialist elements of finance capital. It was explained how the imperialists were planning to drastically increase the looting of the toiling masses. They were preparing to wage a new imperialist world war, to attack the Soviet Union, to divide up China among the imperialist powers, and thus to stop the advance of the revolution. As major imperialist countries started setting up fascist governments, they aggressively started local wars in preparation for a new world war for the redivision of the world. As Germany and Japan started attacking and invading new areas, the other imperialist powers like Britain, France, and the USA started a policy of compromise and concession toward the fascist aggressors and attempted to use them to destroy the Soviet Republic. It was in the context of such dangerous tactics by the imperialists that the international proletariat had to work out and implement its tactics. The tactics of the proletariat were directly opposed to the tactics of the imperialists. The aims of the international working class were the defense of the Soviet Union, the defeat of fascism and the instigators of war, the victory of the national liberation struggles, and the establishment of Soviet power in as many countries as possible. In order to achieve these aims, the Third International adopted tactics as per Marxist principles of war tactics. As during World War I, the International called on all communists to try to prevent the outbreak of war, and in case a war actually broke out, the International gave instructions that all communists should work to convert the unjust imperialist war into civil war and thus complete the revolution. However, the main difference from the World War I situation was that now there was a single socialist base, the Soviet Union. It was the duty of every communist to defend the socialist base. Thus, in case the Soviet Red Army was forced to enter the war in the defense of the Soviet Union, then the nature of the war would change. It would become a just war for the defense of socialism, and it would become the task of every communist to mobilize the workers and toiling masses of all countries for the victory of the Red Army over imperialism. Thus, the communist approach to the war and the task of the communist parties of the world was made clear in 1935, four years before the actual outbreak of war. The Third International further drew up detailed United Front tactics in order to fight fascism and implement the above understanding. 
In the capitalist countries, two types of fronts were to be formed. One was the anti-fascist workers' fronts, which were to be formed along with the social democratic parties. The other was the anti-fascist people's front, which were to be formed where necessary along with other anti-fascist parties besides the social democrats. In colonies and semi-colonies, the task was to form anti-imperialist people's fronts including with the national bourgeoisie. The final aim of the communists in participating in all these fronts was to achieve the victory of revolution in their own countries and the worldwide defeat of capitalism. In the years leading up to the war, most of the communist parties tried to implement the above tactics. United fronts were formed and movements developed in many countries. However, during the various twists and turns in the situation, and in the differing concrete conditions in various countries, some of the parties were not successful in implementing the correct tactics. The Soviet government, however, which faced the most dangerous situation, was able, under Stalin, to employ the correct tactics in the concrete situation of World War II. In the pre-war years, all attempts were made to build up a united front of the non-fascist governments against the group of fascist aggressor countries. However, it soon became clear that these countries were not interested in the united front, but were trying their best to use Germany to crush the Soviet Union. In order to defeat such tactics, Stalin entered into a no-war pact with Germany in August 1939, forcing the first part of the war to be a war between the imperialist powers. Thus, communist parties throughout the world worked according to the tactics of, quote, turning the war into a civil war, unquote, during the first two years of the war. The Soviet Union used this period to make all possible preparations for its defense, in case any of the imperialist countries launched an attack. This happened in June 1941 when Germany attacked the socialist base. With this attack, the Red Army was forced to respond, and the character of the war changed to that of an anti-fascist people's war, and the tactics envisaged earlier by the Third International became applicable. Some of the parties, employing the correct tactics and making use of the severe revolutionary crisis, could achieve revolution. In particular, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, CPSU, was able to lead the Red Army and the whole Soviet people to a heroic victory in the war. It defeated the mighty German army and joined hands with the communist parties and fighters of the East European countries to liberate them from German occupation. Thus, utilizing these tactics, the international proletariat not only succeeded in protecting its socialist base, but by 1949, broke the imperialist chain at several places, came out of the imperialist world system, and built a socialist camp covering one-third of humanity. Thus, the strategy and tactics charted out by the Third International during the period of the Second World War were proved in practice to be basically correct. However, there were also serious failures. This was mainly due to incomplete education by the Third International leadership on the correct approach in implementing these tactics, and the strong remnants of the Second International reformist approach in many of the European parties and the parties formed by them, like the Communist Party of India. Parties like the CPI and the Communist Party of Great Britain spent most of its time in the People's War period trying to increase production. Many such parties did a lot of strike-breaking activity and became alienated from the working class. Some others, like the Communist Party of France, which joined in united fronts with ruling class parties, did not even try to maintain any difference between communists and other reactionaries in the united front. Such an approach led to these parties becoming tales of the ruling classes in the united fronts in which they participated. It also led to the development of rightist tendencies, which in the following period would result in the leaderships of almost all these parties taking the path of revisionism. The Third International, while not being able to combat these revisionist tendencies, had also lost its effectiveness in providing guidance in these vastly different conditions faced by the various member parties. Except for the regular publication of its periodicals, common turn activity had greatly reduced from 1940, and even the customary May Day and October Revolution manifestos were discontinued between May 1940 and May 1942. It was finally decided to dissolve the common turn. Since a Congress could not be convened in the conditions of the war, the Presidium of the Executive Committee of the Communist International, ECCI, sent out a resolution recommending the dissolution of the International to all its sections. After receiving approval from most of the sections, including all the important sections, the common turn was dissolved on June 10, 1943. Chapter 24, Mao's Early Years Mao Zedong was born on December 26, 1893, in the village of Shaoshan, in the fertile valley of Shaoshan in Hunan province, China. The district where Mao was born was a wealthy agricultural area. It was also a strategic area with all major routes by road or river passing through the Hunan province. 
Being at the crossroads of commerce, the Hunan people were known for their peasant traders. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Hunan also became an intellectual center and a center of dissidence and revolt, producing many of China's best scholars. It produced both the military generals who helped the Chinese emperors, as well as the revolutionaries who overthrew their rule. It was also a major center of the biggest peasant revolt of the 19th century, the Great Taiping Peasant Uprising. Hunan provided locks of fighters for the rebellion, which lasted for 14 years from 1850 to 1864. This vast support for the peasant revolt was because of the severe poverty of the peasantry due to exploitation by the landlords and excessive taxation. Though the uprising had been brutally crushed, the memory of the revolt remained strong in the villages around where Mao spent his childhood and youth. Mao's father, Mao Yi Chang, was born a poor peasant and was forced to become a soldier for seven years in order to pay off his father's debts. Later, through hard work and careful saving, he was able to buy back his land. He grew to become a middle peasant and a petty trader. The standard of living of the family, however, remained very poor. Even at the age of 16, Mao only ate one egg a month and meat about three or four times a month. Mao's father put his children to work as soon as possible. Thus, Mao started work in the fields at the age of six. Mao's mother, Wen Qi Mei, was from the Xinjiang district just 16 miles from Shaoshan. Mao was the eldest son. He had two younger brothers and an adopted sister. All three were among the members of the first peasant communist party branch that Mao formed. All became martyrs in the revolution. Mao was a rebel from a very young age. He called his father the, quote, ruling power, unquote. He often united with his mother, brother, and the labor against the authority of his father. This was the opposition. At school, too, he opposed the old customs. Once in protest against his school teacher at the age of seven, he ran away for three days and stayed in the mountains surrounding his village. After this protest, which Mao calls his first successful strike, he was not beaten in school. Mao's first school was the village primary school, which he joined at the age of seven. As soon as he learned to read sufficiently, he developed a passion for reading. He preferred romantic books of rebellion and adventure. Very often he would read the whole night by the light of an oil lamp. Mao's father, who himself had very little schooling, was not interested in Mao continuing his education for too long. He needed somebody to work in the fields and to maintain his accounts. So in 1906, he withdrew Mao from the village school. Mao, however, continued his interest in reading and constantly demanded to be sent for further education. His father could not understand this interest of his son and thought the solution was in marriage. At the age of 14, Mao was married to a girl from the same area. Mao, however, refused to consummate the marriage. Meanwhile, the revolutionary atmosphere was rapidly growing in the surrounding areas. Two rebellions took place in this period which had a lasting impact on Mao. One was the revolt in Hunan in 1906 led by the revolutionaries of the party of the nationalist Sun Yat-sen. The other was a rebellion against a landlord by a group of peasants of Shaoshan itself. Both were crushed and the leaders were beheaded. Mao was very much affected by the injustice and longed to do something radical for the country and its people. He also longed to continue his education. Finally, in 1910, he was sent to a higher primary school in his mother's home district, Jingjing. The students in this school were all from landlord and rich backgrounds who initially looked down upon Mao. Mao, however, soon outshone all the other students by his superior intellect, hard work, and study. He sat reading for long hours in the classroom after everyone left. His teachers were highly impressed by his ability. Within a few months, however, he was restless to move on to a higher level. After a year, he easily passed the exams for admission to the middle school, which was situated in Changsha, the provincial capital of Hunan. In September 1911, Mao walked the 40 miles to Changsha. Mao, who was almost 18, saw a city for the first time. Changsha, a city of scholars, was in extreme turmoil at the time of Mao's arrival. Revolutionary associations under various names had been formed by teachers and students. Underground literature was being circulated, and an explosion was expected at any moment. Mao, who had already developed some radical thinking, was eager to participate in the events. Within a month of Mao's arrival, the 1911 bourgeois revolution broke out under the leadership of Sun Yat-sen. Mao immediately decided to join the Revolutionary Army. The revolution, however, was soon betrayed and landed in the hands of counter-revolutionaries. After five months, Mao resigned from the army and landed back in Changsha. On his return, Mao was in search of what to do and what direction to take in life. 
Looking up advertisements in newspapers, he registered for a number of courses in schools, ranging from soap-making school and a police school to a law school and a commercial school. He finally sat for the entrance examination for the first provincial middle school in Changsha and stood first. After six months, however, he left the school and arranged a schedule of education of his own, which consisted of reading every day at the Hunan Provincial Library. For six months, he spent every day from morning to night at the library, with just a small lunch of two rice cakes. This period of intensive reading covered a very wide range of social and scientific topics of Western, as well as Chinese, authors. It laid the foundation of Mao's education. Six months of such study, however, left Mao totally penniless. His father, who could not understand his son's desire to just go on reading on his own, refused to support him unless he joined a real school. Thus, in 1913, Mao joined the Hunan First Normal College, which was a teacher's college. He remained there for five years from 1913 to 1918. The collapse of the central Chinese government and the outbreak of World War I had created conditions of extreme upheaval throughout China and the world. In China, wars between provincial armies of warlord generals became a common occurrence. It was also the period when Japan, making use of the involvement of the other imperialist powers in war, tried to achieve total domination over China. This led to strong opposition from Chinese intellectuals and revolutionary sectors. It was during these years that Mao's political ideas took shape. In 1915, he became a secretary of the Student Society at the Normal College and created the Association for Student Self-Government. This organization organized numerous agitations against the college authorities for student demands. Mao also led this organization in street demonstrations against Japanese domination and their Chinese puppets. This organization later became the nucleus for future student organizations in Hunan province. As the attacks of the warlord generals grew, students in many places formed self-defense corps. In 1917, Mao became the head of his college battalion. He obtained some arms from the local police and led the students in guerrilla attacks on warlord groups to collect more arms. Using his knowledge of guerrilla tactics used by earlier Hunan fighters, as well as study of military theory, Mao built up the college battalion into an efficient fighting force. Mao also took a keen interest in all the major military campaigns of the ongoing World War I. He lectured and wrote articles on strategy and tactics. Mao also involved himself in various other activities. He fought against social evils like smoking opium and prostitution. He fought against the oppression of women and tried to ensure the maximum participation of women in the student movement. He wrote to encourage swimming, sports, and intensive physical training among the students and youth. He himself maintained extreme physical fitness, took cold baths throughout the year, swam in cold water, went barefoot and bare-chested for long walks on the hills, etc. In 1917, he started an evening school where he and other students and teachers taught the workers of Changsha's factories free of charge. In 1918, Mao inaugurated the New People's Study Society, which he had been planning for about a year. It was one of many such student groups, but grew into something else, the core of a political party. From the start, it insisted on action as well as debate. It would not only talk revolution, but practice it, first by revolutionizing its own members, turning them into, quote, new men, unquote. It had girl members and took up, among other issues, the oppression of women in the traditional marriage system. Its activities went according to program of debate, study, and social action. Social action included night schools for workers, visiting factories, demonstrating against Japanese imperialism, writing articles, and fighting for new ideas in the use of vernacular language. In later years, all 13 of the original members of the society joined the Communist Party of China, CPC, founded in 1921. By 1919, there were 80 members, of whom over 40 were to join the party. Around the time of Mao's graduation from the Normal College in 1918, he was joined in Changsha by his mother, who went there for treatment. She, however, could not be cured and died in October 1918. After her death, Mao moved to Beijing, the capital of China, where for six months he took a very low-paying job as an assistant librarian in Beijing University. This job was obtained through Li Daozhao, the university librarian, who was the first Chinese intellectual to praise the Russian Revolution and one of the first to introduce Marxists throughout China. Under Li Daozhao, Mao rapidly developed toward Marxism. He started reading the works of Lenin that had been translated into Chinese. Towards the end of 1918, he joined the Marxist study group formed by Li. He also met many intellectuals and Marxists. One who had an impact then on him was Chen Du Zhu, who was later to become the first secretary general of the CPC. 
Chen at that time was editor of the radical magazine New Youth, for which Mao had already written and had an influence on him. Mao spent only six months in Beijing. During this period, however, he fell in love with Yang Kaiwei, the daughter of one of his Changsha College lecturers, who was a professor at Beijing University. She was a student doing a course in journalism at the university. For both, it was their first love. Their love was the type that had been then called, quote, new unquote love, where the partners made their own choice, going against the traditional system of arranged marriages. For some time, their love remained secret. They were not sure whether there was time for love when the country needed them so much. They decided to wait some time before taking a final decision. In April 1919, Mao returned to Changsha just before the outbreak of the historic May 4th movement of 1919. This anti-imperialist democratic movement shook the whole of China. Though initiated by the students, it rapidly covered vast sections of workers, merchants, shopkeepers, artisans, and other sections. Mao immediately involved himself wholeheartedly in political agitation. On his arrival, he had admittedly taken a low-paying job as a primary school teacher. All his spare time, however, was spent in organizing agitations and spreading Marxism. He encouraged the study of Marxism in the New People's Study Society and other student societies with which he was in contact. He built up the United Students Association of Hunan, which encompassed even young school students and girl students in large numbers. Uniting all sections, Mao organized a movement for the seizure of burning of Japanese goods. He published a weekly magazine, the Zhang River Review, which quickly had a great influence on the student movement in southern China. When the weekly was banned in October 1919, Mao continued to write in other journals. Soon he got a job as a journalist for various Hunan papers and set out for the big cities of Wuhan, Beijing, and Shanghai to win support for the Hunan movement. However, when he landed in Beijing in February 1920, he soon got involved with the plans to build the Communist Party of China. He held discussions with his university librarian mentor, Li Daozhao, and other intellectuals. He visited the factories and railway yards and discussed Marxism with the workers. He did further study of the works of Marx and Engels and other socialists. He also met Yang Kaiwei, again, who had been studying Marxism. They discussed their dedication to each other and to the revolution. They got engaged. After Beijing, Mao spent four months in Shanghai, China's biggest city and its biggest industrial and commercial center. Here he held discussions with Chen Dujui, another Shanghai Marxist. To support himself, he took a job as a laborer, working 12 to 14 hours in a laundry. During this period, in May 1920, China's first communist group was set up in Shanghai. When Mao moved back to Hunan in July 1920, he started working to set up a similar communist group there. His father had died in the beginning of the year and Mao made his home in Shaoshan initially. His two brothers and adopted sister were among his first recruits. He then moved back to Changsha, where he continued recruiting. There he took a job as a director of a primary school, and also taught one class at the normal college for which he received a comfortable salary for the first time. Towards the end of 1920, Mao married Yang Kaiwei, and they lived together for the one and a half years that Mao was in Changsha as a primary school director. They were regarded as an ideal couple with Yang also being involved with the work of the party, of which she became a member in 1922. They had two sons, one of whom died in 1950 as a volunteer in the Korean War against U.S. imperialism. The other became an accountant. Yang, who performed secret work for the party, was arrested in 1930 and executed. Though Mao participated in various agitations during this period, the main focus of his work was the formation and building up of the CPC. After forming a communist group in Hunan, Mao went to Shanghai to attend the secretly held First National Congress of the CPC in July 1920. He was one of 12 delegates who represented only 57 party members at the time. After the Congress, Mao became the Provincial Party Secretary of Hunan Province. From the very beginning, he paid particular attention to building the party in Hunan on the basis of Leninist party principles. He recruited youth from the existing revolutionary organizations as well as advanced workers who were won by extending the workers' movement. He started two monthly magazines to raise the ideological and political level of the party and youth league members and to help them to carry on communist education among the masses. It was during this period up to 1923 that Mao concentrated a great deal on the organizing of workers in Changsha, the Anwan Colliery, in neighboring Zhangji province, and in the Shuikashan lead mine. By August 1921, he set up the first communist trade union. In 1922, he formed the Hunan branch of the All-China Labor Federation, of which he was made the chairman. 
The Anwan Colliery movement and organization in particular was an excellent example of communist organizing. At first, the party ran spare time schools for the workers of the colliery to carry on Marxist education. It then organized a trade union. Meanwhile, a branch of the Socialist Youth League was formed among the workers, the best members of which were later absorbed into the party. The Anwan Colliery saw major strikes, which had countrywide repercussions. It had a strong organization, which survived even during the repression periods. The workers provided valuable support and participation at various stages in the Revolutionary War. Anwan was the liaison center for the first communist base in the Xingang Mountains. Mao did not participate in the Second National Congress of the CPC, held in July 1922, because he missed his appointment. He participated in the Third National Congress of the CPC, held in June 1923, at which he was elected to the Central Committee. This Congress decided to promote an anti-imperialist, anti-feudal national front in cooperation with the Kuomintang Party, led by Sun Yat-sen. It directed Communist Party members to join the Kuomintang Party as individuals. Mao did so, and was elected as an alternate member of the Kuomintang Central Executive Committee at its first and second national congresses, held in 1924 and 1926. He worked as head of the Central Propaganda Department of the Kuomintang, edited the Political Weekly, and directed the sixth class at the Peasant Movement Institute. Chapter 25, Mao's Fight Against Right and Quote Left Unquote Lines in Victory of the Chinese Revolution. The first revolutionary civil war, from 1924 until the beginning of 1926, the Chinese revolution advanced rapidly with the proletariat and peasantry in great foment. In 1925, the protest against the May 30th massacre of demonstrators by the British police in Shanghai turned into an anti-imperialist people's movement, involving all sectors of the masses throughout the country. The country was on the verge of a decisive battle between revolution and counter-revolution. However, two deviations then plagued the CPC. The dominant right opportunist clique was led by the party general secretary, Chen Dushui. He took the stand that the bourgeois democratic revolution must be led by the bourgeoisie, and the aim of the revolution should be to form a bourgeois republic. According to his line, the bourgeoisie was the only democratic force with which the working class should unite. He did not consider any possibility of building an alliance with the peasantry. On the other hand, quote, left unquote opportunists were represented by Zhang Gu Tao, the leader of the All China Federation of Labor. He saw only the working class movement. He argued that the working class was strong enough to make revolution alone. Thus, his clique also ignored the peasantry. While fighting these two deviations, Mao made his first major contributions to the development of Marxist theory. In March 1926, he published his famous analysis of the classes in Chinese society, and in March 1927, he presented his report on an investigation of the peasant movement in Hunan. In these works, he tried to answer the most basic questions of the Chinese revolution. Who are the friends and enemies of the revolution? Who is the leading force and who are the reliable and vacillating allies? He argued that it was the proletariat and not the bourgeoisie who would have to lead the revolution. However, the proletariat would not be able to win by fighting alone. He stressed the role of the peasantry, which was the closest and most numerous ally of the proletariat. He also pointed out that the national bourgeoisie was a vacillating ally with the possibility of the right wing becoming an enemy and the left wing remaining a friend of the revolution. Mao also presented his ideas on how the masses were to be mobilized, a revolutionary government established, and the peasant armed forces organized. This was Mao's clear perspective on the direction of the revolutionary forces should take. This was the time of the Northern Expedition, which was a critical part of the first phase of the Chinese Revolution, the First Revolutionary Civil War. It was a march by the Revolutionary Army, under the leadership of the Revolutionary National United Front, the Kuomintang CPC United Front. Starting in July 1926 from Guangdong in southern China, its aim was to smash the reactionary government of the imperialist-backed Northern warlords in a revolutionary war and achieve the independence and unity of China. The Northern Expedition was initially a major success with the whole of southern China and many of the southern warlords being defeated or won over. Under the influence of the Northern Expedition, there was an upsurge among the peasantry. The proletariat staged many armed uprisings in cities to coincide with the advance of the Revolutionary Army. Even Shanghai, the largest industrial and commercial city of China, was liberated in March 1927 after three attempts at armed worker uprisings. After achieving major victories, however, the bourgeoisie clique, represented by Chiang Kai-shek, 
the main Kuomintang leader after Sun Yat-sen's death in 1925, broke the United Front. In April 1927, massacres backed by the imperialists were launched on the communist cadres in various parts of the country. The right opportunist, Chen Duzhu, leadership of the CPC, instead of mobilizing the workers and peasants against the Kuomintang reactionaries, however, submitted to them. In July 1927, another Kuomintang clique launched massacres against the communists. This resulted in the breaking up of the United Front and the defeat of the First Revolutionary Civil War. The right line of Chen Duzhu, which dominated throughout the period of the First Revolutionary Civil War, was one of the important reasons for the failure of the revolution during this period. Though Mao struggled against this right line, he could not win the support of the majority in the party. In fact, at the Fifth National Congress held in April 1927, Chen succeeded in removing Mao from the Central Committee. The Second Revolutionary Civil War Period In August 1927, at the start of the next period, the Second Revolutionary Civil War Period, Chen Duzhu was removed as General Secretary after a firm criticism of his right opportunism. Mao was brought back onto the Central Committee and made an alternate member of the Provisional Politburo that was set up. However, the correct criticism of the right line gave way in November 1927 to the domination of a quote, left unquote line in the Central Committee. Under the leadership of Q.Q. Bai, an intellectual comrade who returned after training in the Soviet Union, this line made the wrong assessment that the Chinese Revolution was on a quote, continuous upsurge, unquote, and therefore called for armed uprisings in many cities. The leadership criticized Mao for advocating and leading a peasant uprising and opposing uprisings in big cities. He was again removed from his central posts. He was also removed from membership of the Hunan Provincial Committee. The quote, left unquote line led to heavy losses and the abandonment of this line by April 1928. The Sixth Congress of the CPC held in Moscow in June 1928 rectified this first quote, left unquote line and adopted a basically correct understanding, repudiating both the right and the quote, left unquote positions. Though Mao did not attend the Congress, it basically upheld his position on many points. In his absence, he was again elected to the Central Committee. It was while implementing this understanding and while building up the Red Army after the failures of the Northern Expedition and the city uprisings that Mao made his further contributions to the development of Marxist-Leninist theory. He wrote, Why is it that red political power can exist in China? in October 1928 and the struggle in the Xinjiang Mountains in November 1928. These historical works provided the theoretical basis for the historic process of building up and developing the Red Army then underway. Mao, starting from a small group of worker and peasant fighters, had, after the failure of the peasant uprisings in 1927, set up the first base in Jingang Mountains in October 1927. Through the period from 1927 to the beginning of 1930, the area of armed peasant uprisings and rural revolutionary bases grew steadily. Many of the fighting sections under communist leadership joined Mao's forces. The Red Army grew to 60,000 soldiers and a little later to 100,000 soldiers. However, quote, left unquote ideas again started gaining ascendancy and from 1930 took over the leadership of the party. Two, quote, left unquote lines led by Li Li Zan in 1930 and Wang Ming in 1931 through 34 dominated the party and caused incalculable harm. In June 1930, Li Li Zan drew up a plan for organizing armed uprisings in the major cities throughout the country and for concentrating all the units of the Red Army to attack these major cities. The attempt to implement this plan between June and September 1930 led to severe losses and a demand from cadres for its rectification. During this period, Mao led an attack on Changsha, but withdrew to prevent heavy losses in the face of superior imperialist and Kuomintang forces. After the withdrawal, there was brutal repression in Changsha during which Yang Kaihu, Mao's wife, who was doing underground work there, was executed. Li Li San did self-criticism at a plenum held in September 1930 and stepped down from leadership positions. Mao and Zhu Dei, commander of the Red Army, were taken onto the newly formed Politburo. This Politburo was, however, bypassed by a plenum called in January 1931 by Wang Ming, one of the group of the 28 so-called, quote, Bolsheviks, unquote, who had returned from training in the Soviet Union. They did not call Mao and Zhu Dei for the plenum, but removed them and others from the Central Committee. In August 1932, Mao was also removed from his post as Secretary of the Front Committee and Political Commissar of the Red Army. With the party and Red Army in their full control, the Wang Ming clique committed numerous errors which led to severe losses. 
Throughout, their main attack was on Mao, who was the representative of what was, according to them, right opportunism and the main danger within the party. Mao's correct line was called a, quote, rich peasant line, unquote. Sectarian and factional methods were used by the, quote, left, unquote, line leadership to attack not only Mao, but also the leaders of the earlier, quote, left, unquote, lines. Li Li San and Q Q Bai. While the Wang Ming clique was creating havoc in the party, Chiang Kai-shek was organizing repeated campaigns of encirclement and suppression against the red base areas. The first four campaigns were defeated because of Mao's leadership and the influence of his strategic principles before the quote, left unquote leadership acquired full control over the party and Red Army in the base areas. However, when the quote, left unquote leadership actually moved into the base area, their direct leadership led to serious errors in the defeat of the communist forces in the fifth campaign of the Kuomintang forces. In order to break through Chiang Kai-shek's encirclement and win new victories, it was decided from October 1934 to undertake the world-shaking strategic move of the Red Army, known as the Long March. Mao was accompanied by his next wife, He Zaizen, a party cadre from a local peasant family in the Zhangji base area. They had married in 1931 after the death of Mao's earlier wife, Yang kai Hu. They had two children who were left behind with peasants in the Zhangji base area at the start of the Long March. It was during the Long March, at the Zunyi Plenum of the CPC in January 1935, that leadership of the party moved into the hands of Mao and his policies. This was a turning point for the Long March as well as for the Chinese Revolution. It was then decided to continue the Long March in the northward direction to be able to better coordinate the nationwide anti-Japanese movement, which had been growing continuously since the Japanese attack and occupation of northeastern China in 1931. During the Long March, besides the repeated attacks on the Kuomintang troops, the party had also to face a line of flightism and warlordism led by Zhang Gutao. Two conferences of the Central Committee held during the Long March defeated Zhang Gutao's proposal to retreat to the national minority areas of Xinjiang and Tibet. However, he refused to follow the party decision and tried to form a new party center. He led a section of the Red Army in a different direction, which was attacked and finished off by Kuomintang forces. Zhang became a traitor and joined the Kuomintang. The main force of the Red Army reached their destination in Shanxi province in northern China in October 1935, one year after they had started the Long March. The Red Army, which numbered around 300,000 just before the beginning of the Fifth Encirclement Campaign, had now been reduced to just over 20,000. It was this corps that set up the Shanxi Gansu Ningji on the border areas of these three provinces in northern China, base area. It became famously known as Yan'an, the name of its capital. This was the base from which Mao led the party and Red Army to victory in 1945 in the war against Japan. Mao and Hei Zizhen were divorced in 1938. In April 1939, he married Jiang Qing. Jiang Qing was the party name of Lan Ping, a theater and film actress who had joined the party in 1933 and moved to Yan'an in 1937 to teach drama at the Art Academy there and participate in the propaganda teams that went among the peasantry. Mao, who took a keen interest in art and literature, met her in the course of this work, and they fell in love and decided to get married. The Period of the War of Resistance Against Japan Immediately after the completion of the Long March, Mao concentrated on the adoption and implementation of a new tactical orientation in order to end the civil war and unite the maximum forces for a war of resistance against Japan. His presentation on tactics against Japanese imperialism was a major development of Marxist-Leninist United Front tactics. This was later further developed in his May 1937 report on the tasks of the Chinese Communist Party in the period of resistance to Japan. Giving a brilliant exposition of the stage of development of China's internal and external contradictions, Mao explained the change in the principal contradiction caused by Japan's aggression, and therefore the change in the United Front tactics necessary to face the new situation. He called for a united front with the Kuomintang in order to drive away the Japanese aggressors. Chiang Kai-shek, however, did not agree to enter a united front until he was forced to do so by the CPC's propaganda and by the pressure of certain factions in his own party. He finally agreed when he was arrested in December 1936 by two of his own generals, who insisted that a united front should be built up with the CPC. The anti-Japanese united front was set up in August 1937. During the period of the War of Resistance, Mao had again to fight wrong trends, though these did not grow to capture leadership over the party in the struggle. One was a pessimistic trend of national subjugation present in some Kuomintang sections of the United Front. These people, after some defeats at the hands of the Japanese, felt that the Chinese was bound to be suppressed, 
and ruled by Japanese and other imperialists. One faction even prepared for surrender. On the other hand, there was the trend in some sections of the CPC who felt that since the United Front had been formed, there would be quick victory over the Japanese. These comrades overestimated the strength of the United Front and did not see the reactionary side of the Chiang Kai-shek clique. In order to correct these mistaken theories and to point out the correct course of the war, Mao published his book on protracted war in May 1938, which pointed out that the war would finally end in victory, but that the victory would not be quick. Also, in this and other writings, he laid down the military principles of the war. Mao also wrote various philosophical works to help educate the party cadres and remove the damaging effects of the earlier right and quote left unquote lines. Basing on these writings between 1941 and 1944, a lengthy rectification campaign was held to fight the main heirs in the party. This was combined with in-depth discussions to review the history of the party. Zhao Enlei, who had been a leading comrade throughout the period, particularly participated in this process. This led finally to an open and complete repudiation of the earlier wrong lines. This understanding was adopted in the resolution on certain questions in the history of our party at the plenum of the CPC held in April 1945. Armed with the correct line and correct tactics, the CPC led the Chinese people to victory, first in the war of resistance against Japan, and then against the reactionaries led by Chiang Kai-shek. From a fighting force of just over 20,000 at the end of the Long March, the Red Army grew to a strength of 1 million towards the end of the anti-Japanese war in 1945. At the 7th Congress of the CPC in April 1945, Mao in his report on coalition government presented a detailed summing up of the anti-Japanese war and an analysis of the current international and domestic situation. He gave a specific program for the formation of a coalition government with the Kuomintang after the victory of the Japanese forces. The Third Revolutionary Civil War Period However, after the victory over the Japanese, Chiang Kai-shek, because of the support of U.S. imperialism and the superior strength of his military forces, refused to agree to the formation of a coalition government on any reasonable terms. At that time, even Stalin wanted the CPC to come to an agreement, saying that they should not have a civil war and should cooperate with Chiang Kai-shek, otherwise the Chinese nation would perish. Nevertheless, the CPC under Mao went ahead and fought what came to be known as the Third Revolutionary Civil War. Relying on the full support of the masses, and particularly the peasantry, the Red Army was able to change the military balance of forces and move in July 1947 from the strategic defensive to the strategic offensive. By October 1949, the CPC had, within a period of four years, won nationwide victory over the U.S.-backed Kuomintang. As China gained victory, Marxist-Leninists and the proletariat throughout the world were filled with joy and pride at the formation of a seemingly invincible socialist camp encompassing one-third of humanity. Mao, however, gave an idea of the challenges ahead and dangers of the coming period. In 1949, on the occasion of the 28th anniversary of the founding of the CPC, in his speech on the People's Democratic Dictatorship, Mao said, quote, 28 years of our party is a long period, in which we have accomplished only one thing, we have won basic victory in the Revolutionary War. This calls for celebration, because it is the people's victory, because it is a victory in a country as large as China. But we still have much work to do. To use the analogy of a journey, our past work is only the first step in a long march of 10,000, unquote. Chapter 26, The Path of Revolution for Colonies and Semi-Colonies Immediately after the establishment of the People's Republic of China, the international communist movement gave open recognition to the significance of the Chinese path of revolution for colonies and semi-colonies. On January 27, 1950, in an editorial entitled For a Lasting Peace for a People's Democracy, in the organ of the common form, it was stated, quote, The path taken by the Chinese people, is the path that should be taken by the people of many colonial and dependent countries in their struggle for a national independence and people's democracy. The experience of the victorious national liberation struggle of the Chinese people teaches that the working class must unite with all classes, parties, groups, and organizations willing to fight the imperialists and their hirelings and to form a broad nationwide united front headed by the working class and its vanguard, the Communist Party. A decisive condition for the victorious outcome of the national liberation struggle is the formation, when the necessary internal conditions allow for it, of people's liberation armies under the leadership of the Communist Party. Unquote. Thus, the universal applicability of Marxist-Leninist theory developed by Mao, i.e. Maoism, was recognized and began to become the guideline for genuine revolutionaries throughout the world, particularly in colonies and semi-colonies. 
Mao's formulation of the Chinese path of revolution had been developed in his numerous writings during the advancing of the revolution. Lenin had already pointed out that in the era of imperialism and proletarian revolution, it was the proletariat and not the bourgeoisie that would lead the bourgeois democratic revolution. Mao, in his work on new democracy, carried this understanding further, pointing out that in this era, any revolution in a colony or semi-colony that is directed against imperialism no longer comes with the old category of the bourgeois democratic world revolution, but with any new category. It is no longer part of the old bourgeois or capitalist world revolution, but is part of the new world revolution, the proletarian socialist world revolution. Such revolutionary colonies and semi-colonies can no longer be regarded as allies of the counter-revolutionary front of world capitalism. They have become allies of the revolutionary front of world socialism. Thus, in order to differentiate from the old bourgeois democratic revolution, he called the revolution in colonies and semi-colonies a new democratic revolution. On this basis, he elaborated on the politics, economy, and culture of new democracy. Mao also developed an understanding of the united front that Lenin and Stalin had given. He showed that the bourgeoisie in colonies and semi-colonies was divided into two parts, the comprador bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie. The comprador bourgeoisie, who depended on imperialism for its existence and growth, was always an enemy of the revolution. The national bourgeoisie was a vacillating ally who would sometimes help the revolution and sometimes join the enemies. Thus, the united front under the leadership of the proletariat would consist of a four-class alliance, the proletariat, the peasantry, the urban petite bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. The enemies of the revolution were imperialism, the comprador bourgeoisie, and the landlords. According to Mao, the revolution in colonies and semi-colonies would not follow the path of insurrection followed by the Russian Revolution, where the main cities were captured first and then control taken over the countryside. He showed the Chinese path of protracted people's war, which involved the area-wide seizure of power in the countryside, the building of guerrilla zones and base areas, and the final encircling and capturing of the cities. To achieve this, Mao laid down the military principles of revolutionary war. He taught how to build up the Red Army, which was an absolutely necessary weapon of the revolution. Starting from guerrilla warfare, and then moving to mobile warfare, and finally to positional warfare, Mao showed how a small force can rely on the vast masses to build up the forces needed to defeat a formidable enemy. Finally, basing himself on the Marxist-Leninist understanding of the state and the dictatorship of the proletariat, Mao elaborated on the theory regarding the form of the state and revolutions in colonial countries. On the basis of the theory of new democracy, he formulated the understanding of the new democratic republic. This new democratic republic, he said, would be different from the old European-American form of capitalist republic under bourgeois dictatorship, which is the old democratic form and already out of date. On the other hand, it would also be different from the socialist republic of the Soviet type under the dictatorship of the proletariat. For a certain historical period, this form too was not suitable for the revolutions in colonial and semi-colonial countries. During this period, therefore, a third form of state was necessary to be adopted in the revolutions of all colonial and semi-colonial countries, namely the new democratic republic under the joint dictatorship of several anti-imperialist classes. Since this form suits a certain historical period, it is therefore transitional. Nevertheless, according to Mao, it is a form that is necessary and cannot be dispensed with. This state was established after the victory of the Chinese Revolution in the form of the People's Democratic Dictatorship. Mao explained the essence of the People's Democratic Dictatorship as the combination of two aspects, democracy for the people and dictatorship over the reactionaries. The people are the working class, the peasantry, the urban petite bourgeoisie, and the national bourgeoisie. These classes, led by the working class and the Communist Party, unite to form their own state and elect their own government. They enforce their dictatorship over the running dogs of imperialism, the landlord class and bureaucrat bourgeoisie, as well as the representatives of those classes. Mao further pointed out that the Communist Party had to lead the process of transformation of the People's Democratic Dictatorship into a socialist state. The People's Democratic Dictatorship, led by the proletariat and based on the worker-peasant alliance, required that the Communist Party unite the entire working class, the entire peasantry, and the broad masses of revolutionary intellectuals. These are the leading and basic forces of the dictatorship. Without this unity, the dictatorship cannot be consolidated. It is also required that the party unite with as many of the representatives of the urban petite bourgeoisie and national bourgeoisie who are ready to cooperate as possible, and with their intellectuals and political groups. This was necessary to isolate the counter-revolutionary forces. If this were done, it would be possible, 
after the victory of the revolution, to speedily restore and develop production, cope with foreign imperialism, steadily transform a backward semi-colonial agricultural economy into an industrial country, and build up a socialist state. Chapter 27, Mao on Philosophy Mao's writings on philosophy are directed to educating the party cadres and masses in Marxism-Leninism to change their mode of thinking and practice. Mao himself was an ardent student of philosophy. When he got a hold of books on philosophy, he would consume them in intense, concentrated reading. Because of the earlier influence of the dogmatists who had returned after a study in the Soviet Union and could not relate their knowledge to reality, Mao was continuously eager to make the party's study and teaching link to practice. He wanted to make Marxist philosophy, and particularly the Marxist dialectical method of use, to all party cadres and activists and to the common masses. The Theory of Knowledge Of prime importance was Mao's teaching on the theory of knowledge. An important work was his essay on practice, on the relation between knowledge and practice, between knowing and doing. Though it took only two hours of lectures, Mao said it had taken weeks to write. The central point, which Mao explained, is that knowledge does not drop from the sky. It comes from social practice and from it alone. True knowledge, or correct ideas, comes from three kinds of social practice, the struggle for production, the class struggle, and scientific experiment. Theory depends on practice. It is unthinkable, said Mao, that it should not be measured and checked by practice. In turn, theory changes practice and changes our method of work and thinking. Through this is brought about the transformation and gaining of more knowledge. No one is born wise or born stupid. Knowledge cannot come before material experience. Nobody can become an expert before practically doing a thing. Mao explained the process of obtaining knowledge. It starts from perceptual knowledge, the stage of sense perceptions and impressions, where man at first sees only the separate aspects, the external relations of things. As social practice continues, things that give rise to man's sense perceptions and impressions in this course of his practice are repeated many times. Then a sudden change or leap takes place in the brain in the process of understanding, and concepts are formed. Concepts are no longer the phenomena, the separate aspects and the external relations of things. They grasp the essence, the totality, and the internal relation of things. Between concepts and sense perceptions, there is not only a quantitative but also a qualitative difference. Conceptual or logical rational knowledge is a higher stage than the stage of perceptual knowledge. There are two important aspects to this. One is that rational knowledge depends upon perceptual knowledge. It is foolish to think that rational knowledge can be developed without someone first experiencing and obtaining perceptual knowledge. The second important aspect is that perceptual knowledge remains to be developed into rational knowledge. This means that perceptual knowledge should be deepened and developed to the stage of rational knowledge. The acquiring of rational knowledge is, however, not an end in itself. As Marxism has always held, the essential point of all knowledge is to bring it into practice. Thus, as Mao says, quote, discover the truth through practice, and again through practice verify and develop the truth. Start from perceptual knowledge and actively develop it into rational knowledge. Then start from rational knowledge and actively guide revolutionary practice to change both the subjective and the objective world. Practice, knowledge, again practice, and again knowledge. This form repeats itself in endless cycles, and with each cycle the content of practice and knowledge rises to a higher level. Such is the whole of the dialectical materialist theory of knowledge, and such is the dialectical materialist theory of the unity of knowing and doing." Unquote. On contradictions, the other important contribution of Mao to Marxist philosophy was in dialectics, and particularly relating to the understanding and application of contradictions. The understanding and use of contradictions appears at various points and almost throughout all of Mao's analysis and writings. His main work is on contradiction, which is an essay on philosophy written in August 1937 by Mao after his essay on practice, and with the same object of overcoming the serious air of dogmatist thinking to be found in the party at the time. Originally, this essay was presented at two lectures in the anti-Japanese military and political college in Yan'an. Mao's work was in sense the continuation of work by Lenin, who particularly made a deep study of contradictions. Lenin called contradiction, quote, the salt of dialectics, unquote, and stated that, quote, the division of the one and the knowledge of its contradictory parts is the essence of dialectics, unquote. Lenin, in his philosophical notebooks, further asserted, quote, in brief, dialectics can be defined as the doctrine of the unity of opposites. This embodies the essence of dialectics, but it requires explanations and development, unquote. These, quote, explanations and development, unquote, were done some 20 years later by Mao. 
Mao's work was a leap in the understanding of contradictions. He examined the question of contradictions in great detail and clarified them in such a manner as to make them easily understandable and easily usable by anybody. First, he asserted that the law of the unity of opposites is the fundamental law of nature and of society, and therefore also the fundamental law of thought. Following from this, he explained the principle of the universality and absoluteness of contradiction. According to this principle, contradiction is present in all processes of every object and of every thought, and exists in all these processes from beginning to end. Next, he gives the principle of the particularity and relativity of contradiction. According to this principle, each contradiction and each of its aspects have their respective characteristics. A very important concept given by Mao in this respect is regarding the unity and struggle between the opposites in a contradiction. Mao points out that the unity or identity of opposites is conditional. It is thus always temporary and relative. On the other hand, a struggle of opposites is unending. It is universal and absolute. Another important principle which Mao gave and used very often in his analysis was the understanding of the principal contradiction and the principal aspect of a contradiction. According to this principle, there are many contradictions in the process of development of a complex thing, and one of them is necessarily the principal contradiction, whose existence and development determines or influences the existence and development of the other contradictions. Hence, if in any process there are a number of contradictions, one of them must be the principal contradiction playing the leading and decisive role, while the rest occupy a secondary and subordinate position. Therefore, in studying any complex process in which there are two or more contradictions, we must devote every effort to finding its principal contradiction. Once this principal contradiction is grasped, all problems can be readily solved. Similarly, in any contradiction, the development of the contradictory aspects is uneven. Sometimes they seem to be in equilibrium, which is however only temporary and relative, while unevenness is basic. Of the two contradictory aspects, one must be principal and the other secondary. The principal aspect is the one playing the leading role in that contradiction. The nature of a thing is determined mainly by the principal aspect of a contradiction, the aspect that has gained the dominant position. Mao always gave central importance to understanding the principal contradiction in his analysis. Thus, in his analysis of Chinese society, he always analyzed the principal contradiction. This was an advancement of earlier Marxist-Leninist analysis, which did not particularly go into an analysis of the principal contradiction in a country or revolution. Mao, however, asserted that unless we examine the two aspects, the principal and the non-principal contradictions in a process, and the principal and the non-principal aspects of a contradiction, we shall get bogged down in abstractions, be unable to understand contradiction concretely, and consequently be unable to find the correct method of resolving it. The importance of understanding the principal contradiction and the principal aspect of a contradiction was that they represented the unevenness of the forces that are in the contradiction. Nothing in this world develops absolutely evenly, and therefore it is necessary to understand the change in the position of the principal and non-principal contradictions and the principal and non-principal aspects of a contradiction. It is only by understanding the various stages of unevenness in the contradictions and the process of change in these contradictions that a revolutionary party can decide on its strategy and tactics, both in political and military affairs. Lastly, Mao clarified the question of antagonism in a contradiction. According to Mao, Antagonism is one form, but not the only form, of the struggle of opposites. The formula of antagonism, therefore, cannot be arbitrarily applied everywhere. Some contradictions are characterized by open antagonism, others are not. In accordance with the concrete development of things, some contradictions, which were originally non-antagonistic, develop into antagonistic ones, while others which were originally antagonistic develop into non-antagonistic ones. Forms of struggle differ according to the differences in the nature of the contradictions. Non-antagonistic contradictions can be solved by peaceful and friendly means. Antagonistic contradictions require non-peaceful means. Mao came back to the question of antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions during the period of socialist construction and during the Cultural Revolution. He stressed that despite the victory of the revolution, it was wrong to think that contradictions no longer existed in Chinese society. He showed that there were two different types of contradictions that still existed, the contradictions with the enemy and the contradictions among the people. The contradictions with the enemy were antagonistic and had to be dealt with by suppression. On the other hand, the contradictions among the people, which were non-antagonistic, had to be dealt with in such a way that they did not become antagonistic. Mao always stressed the need for the correct handling of contradictions. He pointed out that if contradictions were not understood and handled correctly, there was always the danger of restoration of capitalism. 
Chapter 28, Mao on the Party From the time that Mao took over the leadership of the CPC, he made all efforts to develop the party on true Leninist lines. Due to the domination of the earlier incorrect lines, particularly the third, quote, left, unquote, line of Wang Ming, there were many deviations in party function. Due to a sectarian understanding, there were no proper norms of democratic centralist function and a totally wrong approach to the two-line struggle. Decisions were taken without consultation and without involving the party cadres, and by manipulating the holding of plenums and other meetings. Two-line struggle was not conducted openly, and representatives of another viewpoint were harassed and punished. Also due to the dogmatism, there was no implementation of mass line. Mao made all attempts to rectify these deviations as well as build up proper forums and bodies. In the process, Mao also clarified and developed many organizational concepts. He also tried to correct certain wrong understandings that had grown in the international communist movement, and also in the CPSU under the leadership of Stalin. Democratic Centralism Mao's attempt to correct sectarian and bureaucratic deviations is seen in his explanation regarding democratic centralism. Mao's understanding of democratic centralism is clearly, quote, first democracy, then centralism, unquote. He explained this in many ways, quote, if there is no democracy, there won't be any centralism, unquote, and, quote, centralism is centralism built on the foundation of democracy. Proletarian centralism with a broad democratic base, unquote. This view of Mao is based on his understanding that centralism meant, first of all, centralization of correct ideas. For this to take, it was necessary for all comrades to express their views and opinions and not keep it bottled up inside them. This would only be possible if there was the fullest possible democracy where comrades would feel free to state what they want to say and even vent their anger. Therefore, without democracy, it would be impossible to sum up experiences correctly. Without democracy, without ideas coming from the masses, it is impossible to formulate good lines, principles, policies, or methods. However, with proletarian democracy, it was possible to achieve unity of understanding, of policy, plan, command, and action on the basis of concentrating of correct ideas. This is unity through centralism. Mao did not restrict the understanding of democratic centralism only to a party function. He broadened the understanding to the question of running the proletarian state and building a socialist economy. Mao felt that without democratic centralism, the dictatorship of the proletariat could not be consolidated. Without broad democracy for the people, it was impossible for the dictatorship of the proletariat to be consolidated or for political power to be stable. Without democracy, without arousing the masses and without supervision by the masses, it would be impossible to exercise effective dictatorship over the reactionaries and bad elements or to remold them effectively. Mao made these observations after the rise of modern revisionism in the Soviet Union and saw that the masses had not been mobilized to exercise the dictatorship of the proletariat. He also saw the rise of revisionist tendencies within the CPC at the highest levels and recognized that the only safeguard against such trends was the initiative and vigilance of the lower level cadres and the masses. Thus Mao said in his talk in January 1962, unless we fully promote people's democracy and inter-party democracy, and unless we fully implement proletarian democracy, it will be impossible for China to have true proletarian centralism. Without a high degree of democracy, it is impossible to have a high degree of centralism, and without a high degree of centralism, it is impossible to establish a socialist economy. And what will happen to our country if we fail to establish a socialist economy? It will turn into a revisionist state, indeed a bourgeois state, and the dictatorship of the proletariat will turn into a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, and a reactionary fascist dictatorship at that. This is a question which very much deserves our vigilance, and I hope our comrades will give it a good deal of thought." Unquote. The two-line struggle is another aspect of party organizational principles, regarding which Mao developed Marxist understanding and theory. Mao's approach, based on dialectical materialism, was to see incorrect opinions within the Communist Party as the reflection of alien classes in society. Thus, as long as the class struggle continued in society, there was bound to be its reflection in the ideological struggle within the party. His approach towards these contradictions, too, was different. He saw them as non-antagonistic contradictions initially, which through, quote, serious struggle, unquote, they should try to rectify. They should give ample opportunity to rectify, and only if the people committing errors, quote, persisted, unquote, or, quote, aggravated them, unquote, was there the possibility of the contradiction becoming antagonistic. This was a correction of Stalin's understanding, which he had presented in Foundations of Leninism. Stalin was opposed to any attempt to rectify wrong trends through inter-party struggle, he called such attempts a, quote, theory of defeating opportunist elements by ideological struggle within the party, unquote, which according to him was, quote, a rotten and dangerous theory, 
which threatens to condemn the party to paralysis and chronic infirmity, unquote. Such a presentation refused to accept the possibility of a non-antagonistic contradiction and treated the struggle against opportunism as an antagonistic contradiction from the very beginning. Drawing lessons from the same historical experience, Mao presented the methods of inter-party struggle in the following manner, quote, all leading members of the party must promote inter-party democracy and let people speak out. What are the limits? One is that party discipline must be observed, the minority being subordinate to the majority, and the entire membership of the Central Committee. Another limit is that no secret faction must be organized. We are not afraid of open opponents, we are only afraid of secret opponents. Such people do not speak the truth to your face, what they say is only lies and deceit. They don't express their real intention. As long as a person doesn't violate discipline and doesn't engage in secret factional activities, we should allow him to speak out and shouldn't punish him if he says wrong things. If people say wrong things, they can be criticized, but we should convince them with reason. What if they are still not convinced? As long as they abide by resolutions and decisions taken by the majority, the minority can reserve their opinions." Unquote. Mao's understanding thus was on the clear basis that as long as class struggle existed in society, there was bound to be the class struggle in the party, i.e. the two-line struggle. Therefore, it was only correct that the struggle should be fought out openly according to the principles of democratic centralism. Thus, Mao, through his understanding and implementation of the concept of two-line struggle, attempted to bring about a correct dialectical approach to classes, class struggle, and inter-party struggle. Mass Line Another area where Mao advanced Marxism was regarding mass line. Starting from the basic Marxist-Leninist understanding of the party maintaining the closest possible links with the masses, Mao developed the concept of mass line to a qualitatively new level. At the philosophical level, he showed how it was an essential aspect of the Marxist theory of knowledge. At the political and organizational levels, he showed how it was the basis of a correct political line and also how it was the essential organizational line of inter-party relations. Mao explains that in the practical work of the party, all correct leadership is necessarily, quote, from the masses to the masses, unquote. This means take the ideas of the masses, scattered and unsystematic ideas, and concentrate them, through study turn them into concentrated and systemic ideas, then go to the masses and propagate and explain these ideas until the masses embrace them as their own, hold fast to them and translate them into action, and test the correctness of these ideas in such action. Then once again concentrate ideas from the masses, and once again go to the masses so that the ideas are preserved in and carried through. And so on, over and over again in an endless spiral, with the ideas becoming more correct, more vital and richer each time. This, as Mao says, is the Marxist theory of knowledge. In order to bring into practice the principle, quote, from the masses to the masses, unquote, Mao explains that it is necessary to have a correct relationship between the leading group and the masses in an organization or in a struggle. It is necessary that the party draws together the activists to form a nucleus of leadership and links this nucleus of leadership closely with the masses. If this is not done, the leadership of the party becomes bureaucratic and divorced from the masses. It is also necessary that the leadership does not remain content with merely giving general calls. General calls must be followed up by particular and concrete guidance if they are to be properly implemented. Quote, take the ideas of the masses and concentrate them, then go to the masses, persevere in the ideas and carry them through so as to form correct ideas of leadership, such as the basic method of leadership, unquote. In this way, Mao explains mass line as the basic method of leadership of the party over the masses. Lastly, Mao says that the mass line should not only be seen in the context of leadership of the party over the masses. In fact, Mao also stresses the application of the mass line to inter-party relations. He thus also saw it as an organizational line. Mao points out that to ensure that the line really comes from the masses, in particular that it really goes back to the masses, there must be close ties not only between the party and the masses outside the party, between the class and the people, but above all in between the party's leading bodies and the masses within the party, between the cadres and the rank and file. Thus, Mao shows that it was of crucial importance that close ties be maintained between higher and lower levels of the party. Any breakup in inter-party ties would result in the gap in relation between the party leadership and the masses. It would go against the implementation of mass line. Chapter 29, Socialist Construction, The Chinese Experience The implementation of the new democratic economic program started even before the nationwide victory of the revolution. 
Soon after the Red Army and the Chinese Revolution entered the strategic offensive in 1947, Mao announced and started implementing what was called the three major economic policies of the New Democratic Revolution. These were, one, the confiscation of the land of the feudal class and its distribution among the peasantry, two, the confiscation of the capital of the comprador bourgeoisie, and three, protection of the industry and commerce of the national bourgeoisie. These policies were immediately taken up for implementation in the vast areas of northern China, which were under revolutionary control, and the agrarian reform was completed there by mid-1950. Subsequently, the agrarian reform program was completed in the remainder of the country. General Line and Step-by-Step -step Collectivization In 1951, the party adopted what came to be known as the General Line for Socialist Construction for the period of transition from capitalism to socialism. The basic aim set for this period was to accomplish the industrialization of China together with the socialist transformation of agriculture, handicrafts, and capitalist industry and commerce. The target set to complete this process was roughly 18 years. This was divided into three years of rehabilitation to recover from the damage and destruction of the Civil War, plus 15 years covering three five-year plans for planned development of the economy. In accordance with this general line, a step-by-step -step plan was drawn up for the socialist transformation of agriculture. The first step was to call on the peasants to organize agricultural producer mutual aid teams, consisting of only a few to a dozen or so households each. These teams had only certain basic elements of socialism, like help and cooperation among the members of the team. The second step was to call on the peasants to organize small agricultural producer cooperatives on the basis of these mutual aid teams. These cooperatives were semi-socialist in nature and were characterized by the pooling of land as shares and by unified management. This third step was to call on the peasants to combine further on the basis of these small semi-socialist cooperatives and organize large, fully socialist agricultural producer cooperatives. The basic principles underlying this step-by-step -step plan were voluntary participation and mutual benefit. The peasants were to be persuaded to voluntarily participate in this process of collectivization. The first step of mutual aid teams had started in the revolutionary bases even before the nationwide victory of the revolution. The second step towards elementary cooperatives took place in the years between 1953 and 1955. The third step of transition to advanced cooperatives came about in 1956, there was a literal upsurge of socialist transformation in the countryside. Simultaneously, in the early months of 1956, a related movement rapidly advanced and completed the process of nationalization of businesses. Thus, China's industry and commerce were transferred from private ownership to ownership by the whole people far ahead of schedule. Mao's dialectical approach to the process of socialist construction. The general line was basically reliant on the Soviet model of socialist construction. The emphasis on industry, and particularly on heavy industry, was the central direction of the first five-year plan of 1953 through 57. Further, there was a tendency to adopt all Soviet policies uncritically. With the rise of modern revisionism in the Soviet Union, and particularly after the revisionist 20th Congress of the CPSU in February 1956, the revisionist tendencies in the CPC were immediately strengthened. In 1956, a campaign was started from within the party to, quote, oppose rash advances, unquote, i.e., to stall the process of socialization. At the same time, the revisionist theory of productive forces gained ascendancy within the party, with the prime representative being the party general secretary, Liu Shaoqi. The representatives of this trend upheld the Khrushchevites, negated the class struggle, and concentrated attention towards building modern productive forces, primarily through heavy industry. Their argument was that the productive forces are the main motor of change, and it was the backward productive forces in China that were the main factor holding back the development of the country. Changes in production relations should wait until after the productive forces had been developed enough. The cooperativization of agriculture should wait until industries developed enough to provide machinery for rural mechanization. All these proposals negated the importance of the relations of production and the class struggle. It would lead to growth of revisionist and bureaucratic trends, and the growth of a new exploiting class. Seeing the Soviet experience and realizing the revisionist danger, Mao immediately launched a struggle to defeat these trends, which at that time controlled the party. His first step in the struggle was his speech of April 1956 on the Ten Major Relationships. In this speech, Mao for the first time made a clear-cut critique of the Soviet pattern of socialist economic construction. While referring to the relationship between heavy industry on the one hand and light industry and agriculture on the other, Mao stressed that, quote, 
We have done better than the Soviet Union and a number of East European countries. Their lopsided stress on heavy industry to the neglect of agriculture and light industry results in a shortage of goods on the market and an unstable currency, unquote. Similarly, he criticized the Soviet policy of, quote, squeezing the peasants too hard, unquote. He also attacked the dogmatists within the CPC who, quote, copy everything indiscriminately and transplant mechanically, unquote, while learning from the experience of the Soviet Union and other socialist countries. He also criticized those who were following the example of Khrushchev and indiscriminately criticizing Stalin. He upheld Stalin as a great Marxist with 70% achievements. Thus, through this extensive critique of the Soviet revisionists and the mistakes in the Soviet socialist construction, Mao led the struggle against the then-dominant revisionist line of productive forces within the CPC. However, the biggest contribution of Mao's speech was its major advancements of the understanding of the process of socialist construction and socialist planning. By presenting the problems of socialist construction as ten major relationships, Mao brought dialectics and contradictions to the center of the process of building socialist society. He showed how socialist construction involved not merely the mechanical implementation of targets of production and distribution, but a dialectical understanding of the main contradictions in the process, and the mobilizing of all the positive forces to achieve socialism. Thus he said, quote, It is to focus on one basic policy that these ten problems are being raised, the basic policy of mobilizing all positive factors, internal and external, to serve the cause of socialism. These ten relationships are all contradictions. The world consists of contradictions. Without contradictions, the world would cease to exist. Our task is to handle these contradictions correctly, unquote. Mao followed it up the next year with his work on the correct handling of contradictions among the people. In it, he continued the development of the dialectical understanding of the process of socialist construction. Primarily, he also placed class struggle at the very core of the process. He asserted that, quote, Class struggle is by no means over. The question of which will win out, socialism or capitalism, is not really settled yet, unquote. With this, he began the struggle against the revisionist sections in the party who were saying that class struggle no longer existed under socialism. This marked the beginning of a countrywide rectification movement, the anti-rightist movement. During this period, many high-level cadres had to present their self-criticisms before the masses. Millions of students involved themselves in manual labor to integrate with the workers and peasants. All party cadres in the factories and agricultural cooperatives had to participate in manual labor. Workers began to participate in decision-making in their factories, and a socialist education campaign started among the peasantry. Through this process, the party was brought closer to the people and rightist trends that were growing, both within the party and outside, were checked. Great Leap Forward in the Birth of People's Communes With the progress of the rectification movement, the rightists in the party were put on the defensive. This led, in 1958, to a rectification of the erroneous productive forces theories that had dominated the Eighth Party Congress in 1956. The prime mover of this theory, Liu Shaoqi, was forced to admit before the second session of the Eighth Party Congress in May 1958 that throughout the period before completion of the building of a socialist society, the principal contradiction was between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, between the socialist road and the capitalist road. His report also mentioned the Great Leap Forward, which had then begun. There had been major advances on every front in socialist construction. Industry, agriculture, and all other fields of activity had registered greater and more rapid growth. Aside from rapid growth, however, the Great Leap Forward was a major change in the priorities of the earlier plans in general line. The general line of the Great Leap Forward had been formulated at a Central Committee meeting held at the end of November 1957. It changed the emphasis on heavy industry and aimed at the simultaneous development of agriculture, heavy and light industry. It aimed at reducing the gap between cities and countryside, between worker and peasant, and between worker and peasant on one hand, and the intellectual and manager on the other. It aimed at not merely an economic revolution, but a technological, political, social, and cultural revolution to transform the city and countryside. In 1958, China started building the people's communes. The process first started spontaneously when neighboring peasant associations in a drought-affected area made a plan to merge together their labor and other resources to implement an irrigation project. Mao gave their merger the name, quote, commune, unquote. Mao encouraged such formations, and this immediately led to a rapid spread of communes throughout the country. They were formed by the merger of neighboring cooperatives in order to undertake large-scale projects such as flood control, 
Water Conservancy, Afforestation, Fisheries, and Transport. In addition, many communes set up their own factories for making tractors, chemical fertilizers, and other means of production. The movement to set up people's communes grew very rapidly. The Central Committee of the CPC announced in its famous Wuhan Resolution of December 1958, stating that, quote, Within a few months, starting in the summer of 1958, all of the more than 740,000 agricultural producer cooperatives in the country, in response to the enthusiastic demand of the mass of peasants, reorganized themselves into over 26,000 people's communes. Over 120 million households, or more than 99% of all China's peasant households of various nationalities, have joined the people's communes, unquote. Summing up the political essence, the CC went on to say, The people's commune is a basic unit of the socialist social structure of our country, combining industry, agriculture, trade, education, and military affairs. At the same time, it is the basic organization of the socialist state power. Marxist-Leninist theory and the initial experience of the people's communes in our country enable us to foresee now that the people's communes will quicken the tempo of our socialist construction and constitute the best form for realizing, in our country, the following two transitions. Firstly, the transition from collective ownership to ownership by the whole people in the countryside, and secondly, the transition from socialist to communist society. It can also be foreseen that in the future communist society, the people's commune will remain the basic unit of our social structure. Thus, the commune movement represented a tremendous advancement, which basically completed the process of collectivization of agriculture. However, the expectation of the commune advancing the process of the transition of full public ownership and communism could not be fulfilled to that extent. Also, attempts at setting up urban communes could not be consolidated. In the earliest period of the commune movement during the Great Leap, there were certain quote left unquote heirs. Mao in his speech in February 1959 called it a quote communist wind unquote. These quote left unquote heirs, which Mao identified, were mainly of three types. The first was the leveling of the poor and the rich brigades within the commune by making the whole commune into one accounting union. This meant that shares of the peasant members of richer brigades, the former advanced cooperative, would be smaller than the share they would receive soon after the commune was formed. They would thus resent the formation of the commune, and their participation would not be voluntary. The second error was that capital accumulation by the commune was too great, and the commune's demand for labor without compensation was too great. When larger amounts were kept aside for capital accumulation, the share that the peasant got was lower. Similarly, more labor without compensation can only come where the consciousness has been raised to that extent. The third error was the, quote, communization, unquote, of all kinds of, quote, property, unquote. In some areas, attempts were made to even bring minor property of the peasants like hens and pigs under the commune. This, too, was opposed. These errors were soon corrected. The production brigade, former advanced cooperative, was kept as the basic accounting unit, and in 1962, this was brought to an even lower level, that of the production team. However, though the perspective remained always of raising the level of ownership and accounting to higher levels, as a process of greater socialization and transition towards communism, this did not succeed. The basic accounting and ownership unit continued until 1976 to remain at the lowest level, the production team. Struggle against the capitalist rotors. Though the quote left unquote errors were soon corrected, the hold of the capitalist rotors, led by Li Shao Qi, remained strong within the party's highest levels. The two line struggle was represented in direct and indirect ways. In July 1959, Peng Dahuai, then defense minister, launched a direct attack on the Great Leap Forward, criticizing what he called its quote, petite bourgeois fanaticism, unquote, and desire, quote, to enter into communism in one step, unquote. Mao repulsed these attacks and defended the politics of the Great Leap. However, though Peng was defeated, the other capitalist rotors continued their attacks through indirect means. One method was through a veiled defense of Peng and attacks on Mao in the media. This was through articles and also through plays and cultural performances intended to show how Peng was an upright comrade who had been victimized. The other method was to stall or divert the implementation of key policies decided at the highest levels. A principal example was sabotage of the program of socialist education and the decision to launch a cultural revolution, taken by the 10th plenum of the Central Committee in 1962. Though the capitalist rotors formally agreed, through their control within the party structure, they ensured that there was no mass mobilization. 
They tried to turn the Cultural Revolution in the direction of academic and ideological debate rather than class struggle. Mao, throughout this period, 1959 through 65, fought the battle at various levels. He realized on the basis of the Soviet experience the very real danger of the restoration of capitalism. He, therefore, on the basis of a major study of the politics and economics of the Khrushchevite revisionism, drew the theoretical lessons of this experience for the education of the Chinese and the international proletariat. Through the struggle of the great debate against Khrushchev's modern revisionism, Mao tried to rally the revolutionaries around the world and in China. Through his works like Critique of Soviet Economics and the CPC's analysis of Khrushchev's phony communism and its historical lessons for the world, he tried to inculcate in the party cadres the theoretical foundations for a fight against revisionism and restoration. However, he mainly tried to draw the masses into the struggle to defend and develop socialism and prevent the restoration of capitalism. Besides his earlier mentioned program for socialist education, he also gave slogans for socialist emulation of Da Zai and Da King experiences as model experiences in building socialism. But when all attempts to mobilize the masses were diverted by party bureaucracy, Mao succeeded after tremendous efforts in unleashing the energies of the masses through the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. It was the culmination in practice of Mao's development of the Marxist principles of socialist construction. Chapter 30, The Great Debate, Mao's Fight Against Khrushchev's Modern Revisionism In 1953, after the death of Stalin, a revisionist clique led by Khrushchev enacted a coup and took over the controls of the CPSU, then the leading party of the international proletariat. They threw out or killed the revolutionaries in the party, started the process of the restoration of capitalism and the first homeland of socialism, and proceeded to develop ties with the imperialist camp, particularly U.S. imperialism. By 1956, after securing firm control over the CPSU, at the 20th Congress of the CPSU, they started spreading their revisionist poison among other communist parties. They simultaneously attacked the so-called Stalin personality cult and introduced the revisionist theory of the quote, three peacefuls, unquote, peaceful transition, peaceful coexistence, and peaceful competition. Peaceful transition meant peaceful transition of socialism by the parliamentary road. Khrushchev proposed that in the present era, it was possible to achieve socialism by peacefully winning a majority in parliament and then bringing about reforms to bring in socialism. He thus denied the need for revolution. This theory was thus a repetition of the revisionism of Bernstein and other social democrats. Peaceful coexistence between states having different social systems was proposed by Khrushchev as the general line of the foreign policy of the socialist state. He thus distorted Lenin's policy of peaceful coexistence with capitalist states which was just one aspect of the socialist state's foreign policy of proletarian internationalism. Khrushchev subordinated all other things to his desire to maintain a peaceful existence with imperialism. He made relations with and aid to other socialist countries, and the policy of help to the struggles of oppressed nations dependent upon the requirements of peaceful coexistence with the imperialist powers. This was nothing but a policy of collaboration with imperialism. Peaceful competition was the theory that the contradiction between imperialism and socialism would be resolved through economic competition between the capitalist and socialist system. This theory thus refused to recognize the reactionary and warmongering character of imperialism. It created the illusion that the contradiction between the socialist and imperialist camp was a non-antagonistic contradiction that would be resolved through peaceful forms of struggle. Khrushchev's theory of the three peacefuls was thus a full-fledged revisionist theory, which he wanted to impose on the international communist movement. It was directed towards building up a close relationship with imperialism. In order to implement his schemes and gain the acceptance of the imperialist powers, Khrushchev simultaneously launched a vicious attack on Stalin in the name of the personality cult. In order to demolish the revolutionary principles that Stalin had stood and fought for, it was first necessary to destroy the image of Stalin among revolutionaries and the masses throughout the world. This was done through a campaign of lies and degenerate propaganda. Many of the leaderships of the communist parties of the world backed the revisionist Khrushchevite line. Many prominent leaders and parties had already started taking the revisionist line in their own countries. Browder in the USA had already put forward theories of collaboration between socialism and capitalism and moved out of the international communist movement. Thorez, the former third international leader from France, who developed close relations with the bourgeoisie following the period in the anti-fascist front, had in the post-war years taken national chauvinist positions towards the peoples of the French colonies and became a servant of the French imperialist bourgeoisie. 
Tagliati of Italy, another major third international leader, had wanted to, quote, reform, unquote, and, quote, restructure, unquote, capitalism into socialism through, quote, structural reforms, unquote, through the bourgeois parliament. The Communist Party of India leadership had already changed their tactical line to recognize a peaceful path. Thus, these revisionist forces, which had not been sufficiently criticized and defeated in the earlier period, quite happily collaborated with Khrushchev. However, wherever such parties tired in any serious manner to implement, quote, peaceful transition, unquote, through the electoral system, and wherever such efforts sufficiently threatened the social order, they were eliminated through military coups and savage repression, as in Brazil in 1964, Indonesia in 1965, and Chile in 1973. Among the newly formed people's democracies, the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, led by Tito, from 1948 had already started on the revisionist road and broken off from the socialist camp. Khrushchev, however, soon started making friends with him. Most of the remaining leaderships also aligned with Khrushchev. Within the socialist camp, it was only the CPC and the Albanian Party of Labor that identified and recognized Khrushchevite revisionism and made a valiant and determined defense of Marxism-Leninism. The CPC, under Mao's guidance, was in the vanguard of this struggle. Within two months of the 20th CPSU Congress, the CPC published an article on the historical experience of the dictatorship of the proletariat, which upheld Stalin as an outstanding Marxist-Leninist. This was followed by another article in December 1956 called More on the Historical Experience of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat, which insisted that the socialist camp should clearly demarcate who were its friends and enemies. This was combined with a seven-year-long attempt to struggle with and defeat the Khrushchevite revisionist line within party forums, particularly at the meetings of 60 fraternal parties in 1957 and of 81 fraternal parties in 1960, and at meetings with the CPSU leadership. As the struggle sharpened, in June 1959, the Soviet revisionists withdrew technical assistance in the field of defense, and in July 1960, abruptly withdrew all the Soviet technical experts who were working in China. The same was done in Albania. In April 1960, the CPC published Long Live Leninism and two other articles upholding the basic principles of Leninism on imperialism, war and peace, proletarian revolution, and the dictatorship of the proletariat. These articles opposed the revisionist positions of the CPSU without mentioning it by name. The revisionists, however, continued with their attempts to further systematize the revisionist positions. Thus, in the 22nd Congress of the CPSU held in 1961, the program adopted revised the essence of Marxism-Leninism, namely, the teachings on proletarian revolution, on the dictatorship of the proletariat, and on the party of the proletariat. It declared that the dictatorship of the proletariat was no longer needed in the Soviet Union, and that the nature of the CPSU as the vanguard of the proletariat had changed. The Congress advanced absurd theories of a, quote, state of the whole people, unquote, and a, quote, party of the entire people, unquote. At the Congress, Khrushchev launched an open and public attack on the Albanian party and even gave a call to overthrow its leader, Enver Hoxha. This was opposed by the CPC delegation led by Zhao and Lei. Khrushchev also started encouraging other communist parties to launch public attacks on the CPC. Numerous articles in the Soviet Union also attacked the Chinese leadership. The CPC finally started replying to some of the attacks on Tagliati of the Italian party, Thorez of the French party, Gus Hall of the CPUSA, and others in a series of seven articles, which came out at the end of 1962 and the beginning of 1963. A summary of the main views of the CPC was put out in the famous June 14th letter of 1963, entitled A Proposal Concerning the General Line of the International Communist Movement. The CPSU replied with an open letter to the CPC. Since the whole issue was now in the open, the CPC decided to conduct the debate through the open press. It published nine commentaries on the CPSU's open letter and clarified all of the issues before the masses. This struggle, which came out in the open in 1963 and continued through 1964, came to be known as the Great Debate. The Great Debate was of immense historic significance. It was a principled and comprehensive struggle against modern revisionism. It provided the rallying point for all proletarian revolutionary forces throughout the world. It was also a scientific development of Marxism-Leninism, which gave the international communist movement its revolutionary general line for that period. Mao was the driving force behind the struggle. It was through the Great Debate that Mao advanced the science of Marxism-Leninism by providing the answers to the most significant questions before the international proletariat. The fundamental contradictions in the world, who are friends and enemies, the aims of the movement, and the path for achieving the victory of world socialist revolution. These formulations were mainly contained in the June 14th letter. 
The nine commentaries outlined and elaborated the revolutionary position on various crucial issues facing the international communist movement after World War II. Neocolonialism, war and peace, peaceful existence, Yugoslavia, Khrushchev's revisionism, and the historical lessons to be drawn therefrom. It was through the great debate that Maoism gained further acceptance as the guiding ideology of the revolutionary sections of the international proletariat. Chapter 31 The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, GPCR, was the answer of Marxism to the obstacles and sabotage of the process of socialist construction created by the Khrushchevites and the capitalist rotors. Particularly after the rise of revisionism in the Soviet Union, Mao realized that one of the biggest dangers of the restoration of capitalism came from within the party itself. Throughout the Great Debate, Mao, while fighting revisionism, tried to find the answer to the question of how to prevent the restoration of capitalism. He was at the same time deeply involved in the fight with Chinese Khrushchevites, like Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping. Thus, while concluding the Great Debate in the CPC's last document, which was called On Khrushchev's Phony Communism and Its Historical Lessons for the World, Mao stressed certain points on the question of prevention of the restoration of capitalism. Mao first stressed the recognition of the need to continue the class struggle throughout the period of social society, right to the end. He explained that change in the ownership of the means of production, i.e. socialist revolution on the economic front, is insufficient in itself. He insisted that we must have a thorough socialist revolution on the political and ideological fronts in order to consolidate the revolution, and that this revolution must be continued under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Another point that Mao repeatedly stressed was that in order to carry out this revolution, it was necessary to stick to mass line and to boldly arouse the masses and launch mass movements on a large scale. For this, the party would have to rely on, win over and unite with the masses of the people, who constituted 95% of the population, in a common struggle against the enemies of socialism. Mao also stressed the need to, quote, to conduct extensive socialist education movements repeatedly in the cities and countryside, unquote. In these continuous movements for educating the people, Mao again stressed the need to organize the revolutionary class forces and to, quote, to wage a sharp tit-for-tat struggle against the anti-socialist, capitalist, and feudal forces, unquote. Thus, Mao clearly saw that the extensive participation of the masses was an essential precondition to prevent the restoration of capitalism. This came from Mao's experience of how the revisionists from within the leadership of the party itself were the main elements bringing about the restoration of capitalism. However, within the CPC, there was a strong resistance from the highest levels, led by Liu Shaoqi, to the implementation of these theories and the concrete program being proposed by Mao. Thus, though the, quote, socialist cultural revolution, unquote, was officially accepted at the 10th plenary session of the 8th Central Committee in 1962, the implementation was half-hearted and in a direction counter to the line given by Mao. In fact, the party bureaucracy, under Liu's control, started criticizing Mao for the actions he was trying to take and opposing the actions taken on capitalist rotors, like Peng Duhai. They conducted this criticism through articles in the press and plays and other cultural forums in their full control. Their control was such that Mao could not even get an article defending himself printed in the press in Beijing. Such an article defending Mao and his policies was finally published in November 1965 in the Shanghai Press which was a much more radical center than Beijing. This was what Mao later called, quote, the signal, unquote, for the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, or GPCR, which started a flow of criticism of the party bureaucracy in support of Mao's line in the media and the field of culture. There also arose demands for self-criticism by the main culprits. The party bureaucracy, however, did all they could to prevent this movement from taking on a mass character. The Cultural Revolution Group, which was supposed to initiate and direct it, actually tried to control the dissent and channel it along academic lines. Finally, the Central Committee under the direction of Mao issued a circular on May 16, 1966, dissolving the, quote, Group of Five, unquote, under whose charge the Cultural Revolution was being sabotaged, and set up a new, quote, Cultural Revolution Group, unquote, directly under the Politburo Standing Committee. The May 16th circular gave the call to criticize and break the resistance of the capitalist rotors, particularly those within the party. This action led to the actual initiation of the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution and made it a mass phenomenon involving millions of people. On May 25th, the first big character poster was put up at Beijing University, criticizing its vice chancellor in the education system. This was only the first of thousands of such massive posters put up by the students and masses throughout the country, where they expressed their opinion and criticized what they felt was wrong in society. 
Demonstrations and mass criticisms were held criticizing professors, party bureaucrats, and others for their wrong policies. Soon there was a demand from a section of the students for the abolition of entrance examinations. In June, the Central Committee passed an order suspending new admissions to colleges and universities for six months so that students and youth could more fully participate in the GPCR. However, the six-month period proved too short, and the universities only opened again after four years. Mao too started personally participating in the GPCR. On July 17th, he participated along with 10,000 other swimmers in a mile-long swim across the river Yangtze. This was a symbolic act signifying that he was participating in the flowing stream of the GPCR. On August 5th, during the 11th plenum meeting of the CPC, Mao gave a much more straightforward signal. He put up his own big character poster. His main slogan was, quote, bombard the headquarters, unquote. This was a clear-cut call to attack the capitalist headquarters of the capitalist rotors in the party, headed by Liu Shaoqi. Mao's call gave a further push to actions and militancy of the movement. On August 18th, Mao was present at the first rally of Red Guards in Beijing. It was a million strong. The Red Guards were the members of the thousands of mass organizations that had sprung up throughout the country for participation in the GPCR. The first mass organizations were composed mainly of students and youth, but as the movement grew, such organizations grew among the workers, peasants, and office employees. The August 18th rally was the first of numerous such rallies. At some times, there were over 2 million Red Guards from all over the country assembled in the capital. The 11th plenum defined the GPCR as, quote, a new stage in the development of the socialist revolution in our country, a deeper and more extensive stage, unquote. Mao, in his closing speech at the plenum, said, quote, the great proletarian cultural revolution is in essence a great political revolution under socialist conditions by the proletariat against the bourgeoisie and all other exploiting classes. It is the continuation of the long struggle against the Kuomintang reactionaries waged by the CPC and the broad revolutionary masses under its leadership. It is the continuation of the struggle between the proletariat and bourgeoisie, unquote. The 11th plenum adopted what came to be known as the 16 Articles of the Cultural Revolution. They repeated what had been said by the May 16th circular, that the present revolution was to touch people's souls, to change man. Old ideas, culture, customs, habits of the exploiting classes still molded public opinion, offering fertile ground for the restoration of the past. The mental outlook had to be transformed and new values created. It identified the main target as, quote, those within the party who are in authority and are taking the capitalist road, unquote. It identified the main forces of the revolution as, quote, the masses of the workers, peasants, soldiers, revolutionary intellectuals, and revolutionary cadres, unquote. The objective of the revolution was, quote, to struggle against and crush those persons in authority who are taking the capitalist road, to criticize and repudiate the reactionary bourgeois academic, quote, authorities, unquote, and the ideology of the bourgeoisie and all other exploiting classes, and to transform education, art and literature, and all other parts of the superstructure that do not correspond to the socialist economic base, so as to facilitate the consolidation and development of the socialist system, unquote. The form of the revolution was to arouse the masses and their hundreds of millions to aim their views freely, write big character posters, and hold great debates so that the capitalist rotors in power would be exposed and their plans to restore capitalism could be smashed. The essential aspect of the Cultural Revolution was the advancement and practical implementation of Mao's mass line. It was aimed not merely at eliminating the elements hostile to socialism, but to enable the working class to, quote, exercise leadership in everything, unquote, to, quote, place politics in command of administration, unquote, and to ensure that everyone serving as an official should, quote, remain one of the common people, unquote. In order to achieve these aims, it was necessary to launch an all-out offensive against bourgeois ideology in such a way that the masses would be actively involved. Thus, the 11th Plenum Resolution instructed, in the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution, the only method is for the masses to liberate themselves, and any method of doing things on their behalf must not be used. Trust the masses, rely on them, and respect their initiative. Cast out fear. Don't be afraid of disorder. Let the masses educate themselves in this great revolution and learn to distinguish right and wrong between correct and incorrect ways of doing things. As the masses entered full strength in the revolution, they even created a new organizational form, the Revolutionary Committee. It was based on a, quote, three-in-one, unquote, combination. That is, its members, who were elected, subject to recall, and directly responsible to the people, were drawn from the party, the People's Liberation Army, and the mass organizations. The Red Guards, whose membership reached 30 million in number, they sprung up at all levels, from the factory or commune to the organs of provincial and regional government, 
and their function was to provide the link through which the masses could participate directly in the running of the country. This three-in-one organ of power enabled proletarian political power to strike deep roots among the masses. Direct participation by the revolutionary masses in the running of the country and the enforcement of revolutionary supervision from below over the organs of political power at various levels played a very important role in ensuring that leading groups at all levels adhered to mass line. Thus, the strengthening of the dictatorship of the proletariat was also the most extensive and deepest exercise in proletarian democracy he had achieved in the world. Under the initial sweep of the Cultural Revolution in 1966 through 67, the bourgeois headquarters within the party was effectively smashed, and most of the leading capitalist voters like Liu Shaoqi and Deng Xiaoping and their supporters were stripped off their party posts and forced to do self-criticism before the masses. It was a great victory, which not only inspired the Chinese masses, but also created a wave of revolutionary enthusiasm among communist revolutionaries throughout the world. During the Great Debate, many revolutionary forces had gathered around the revolutionary line of the CPC, led by Mao, but it was mainly during the Cultural Revolution that these forces throughout the world came to accept that it was Maoism that could provide the answers to the problems of world socialist revolution. The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution showed that Marxism had an answer to the enemy of capitalist restoration. This advancement in Marxism led to the consolidation of numerous revolutionary groups and parties throughout the world on the basis of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism and the launching of revolutionary struggles under their leadership. However, Mao warned, quote, The present great proletarian cultural revolution is only the first. There will inevitably be many more in the future. The issue of who will win in the revolution can only be settled over a long historical period. If things are not properly handled, it is possible for capitalist restoration to take place at any time in the future, unquote. Further, he reminded the Ninth Party Congress in 1969, quote, We have won a great victory, but the defeated class will continue to struggle. Its members are still about and it still exists, therefore we cannot speak of the final victory, not for decades. We must not lose our vigilance. From the Leninist point of view, the final victory in one socialist country not only requires the efforts of the proletariat and the broad masses at home, but also depends on the victory of the world revolution and the abolition of the system of exploitation of man by man on this earth so that all mankind will be emancipated. Consequently, it is wrong to talk about the final victory of the revolution in our country lightheartedly, it runs counter to Leninism and does not conform to facts, unquote. Mao's words proved true within a short time. First in 1971, Lin Bao, then vice chairman, who in the Ninth Congress of the CPC had been appointed as a successor to Mao, conspired to seize power by assassinating Mao and staging a military coup. This was foiled through the alertness of the revolutionaries in the party. After this, however, arch revisionists like Deng were rehabilitated back to high positions within the party and state apparatus. During the last period of the Cultural Revolution, there was again a struggle against these capitalist rotors, and Deng was again criticized and removed from all posts a few months before Mao's death on September 9, 1976. However, he had many of his agents in positions of power. It was these renegades who engineered the coup to take over the party and lead it on the path of capitalist restoration very soon after Mao's death. It was they who sabotaged the Cultural Revolution and then formally announced its end in 1976. This coup in capitalist restoration, however, cannot repudiate the validity of the truth of the Cultural Revolution. Rather, in a way, it confirms Mao's teaching on the nature of socialist society and the need to continue the revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat. The Cultural Revolution is a scientific tool developed in the struggle against capitalist restoration and in the theoretical struggle to develop Marxism-Leninism-Maoism. Its scientific validity has been established in the test of practice of the Chinese Revolution. Its effectiveness as a weapon to mobilize the vast masses in the struggle against the danger of capitalist restoration in a socialist country has also been proved. However, as Mao himself pointed out, no weapon can provide a guarantee of final victory. Thus, the fact that the capitalist rotors achieved a temporary victory does not in any way diminish the objective truth of the necessity and effectiveness of this weapon in the fight for socialist construction and the defense of socialism. The Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution is one of the foremost contributions of Marxism-Leninism-Maoism to the arsenal of the international proletariat. It represents the implementation and practice of Mao's greatest contribution to Marxism, the theory of continuing revolution under the dictatorship of the proletariat to consolidate socialism, combat modern revisionism, and prevent the restoration of capitalism. Its significance for the international proletariat is immeasurable in today's world where all the socialist bases have been lost due to the manipulative schemes of the bourgeoisie within the communist parties themselves. Therefore, the time has come to revise Lenin's definition of a Marxist. 
Lenin, while defining a Marxist, said that it was not enough to accept class struggle to be called a Marxist. He said it is only those who recognize both class struggle and the dictatorship of the proletariat that can be called Marxist. Today, it is not sufficient to only recognize class struggle and the dictatorship of the proletariat to be a Marxist. A Marxist has to accept the basic understanding of the GPCR. Thus, he is a Marxist who extends the recognition of class struggle and the dictatorship of the proletariat to the recognition of the continuous revolution in the superstructure, with the aim of the completion of the world revolution and building the communist society as early as possible. Chapter 32, After the Death of Mao The late 60s, the period of the GPCR and the establishment of Maoism as a new stage of Marxism-Leninism, was a period of revolutionary ferment in many parts of the world. The Revolutionary War in Indochina, the area covering Vietnam, Kampuchea, and Laos, dealt severe blows to the tremendous military might of the U.S. imperialists. Simultaneously, revolutionaries breaking away from the hold of the modern revisionist launched armed struggles under the guidance of Maoism in many parts of the Third World during this period. The ongoing armed struggles in the Philippines and India are a continuation since then. National liberation struggles waging guerrilla war also raged in various parts of the world, as well as armed struggles under Guevara's ideology, ideology following the views and practice of Che Guevara, who played a leading role in the revolutionary struggles in Cuba and Bolivia in parts of Latin America. The Indochina War, the sharpening struggles in the Third World, and the GPCR were among the major factors for the vast outbreak of student and anti-war movements throughout the capitalist world at the end of the 60s. The Paris Student Revolt of May 1968 was the most significant but only one of a wave of student revolts ranging from the USA to Italy and even to Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. It also had its impact on student movements in various parts of the Third World. At the same time, the anti-Vietnam War protests started picking up in the USA and other parts of the world, with massive peace movements against war and the nuclear arms race in major cities of Europe. The US imperialists were effectively isolated as not even one of their allies agreed to send troops to fight in Vietnam. Following the student movement, there was also a major growth of struggles of the industrial working class in the West European countries, particularly in Italy and France, though largely on economic demands. Huge waves of strikes with major wage demands often paralyzed entire economies of the imperialist countries. The mid-70s saw the final overthrow of many long-standing colonial regimes after long guerrilla wars. Thus, the U.S. and their puppets were thrown out of Vietnam, Kampuchea, and Laos in 1975. In Africa, the republics of Mozambique, Angola, Ethiopia, Congo, and Benin were formed in this period. However, most of these countries were taken over by puppets or satellites of new imperialism, Soviet social imperialism. A prominent exception was Kampuchea, where genuine communist revolutionaries, the Khmer Rouge, remained independent until invaded in 1978 by Vietnam at the behest of the Soviet imperialists. In the following period, too, there has continued to be an excellent revolutionary situation with the sharpening of all the fundamental contradictions and the further weakening of imperialism. In particular, colonies and semi-colonies continued to be the storm centers of world revolution. At the beginning of this period, guerrilla struggles continued in Zimbabwe, Nicaragua, Eritrea, and other countries. The People's War started in Peru in 1980 under communist revolutionary leadership. The Shah of Iran was overthrown, and an anti-American Islamic Republic came into existence. National Liberation War broke out in Afghanistan after the installation of a Soviet puppet regime in 1978, and occupation by the Soviet Social Imperialist Army in 1979. The heroic struggle of the Afghan people dealt a serious death blow to the Soviet regime and proved to be a major factor in the final collapse of the USSR. The epochal significance of the struggles of the peoples of colonies and semi-colonies has been that it has forever changed the nature of relations between imperialism and the impressed nations. Both the Vietnam and Afghan wars proved that even a superpower could not occupy even a small and weak country. This truth was brought out even more starkly in the 90s in the numerous spots where United Nations peacekeeping forces tried to intervene. In the 90s, Somaliland, which had been controlled for numerous years without major difficulty by British and Italian colonialists, became Somalia, where thousands of American and other troops were forced to retreat in disgrace when attacked by the people. Even the large-scale and continuous bombing of Iraq and Yugoslavia, without the commitment of ground troops, is a recognition by imperialism that no country, nation, or people would in this period be prepared to accept an occupation army. Ever since the collapse of the bureaucratic regimes in East Europe and the various republics of the former Soviet Union, there has been a continuous revolutionary crisis there too. 
Even in the Western imperialist countries, worsening of the crisis has led to the intensification of the contradictions between labor and capital, and repeated waves of strike struggles by the industrial working class. The revolutionary forces, however, have not been organizationally strong enough to utilize the excellent worldwide revolutionary situation to advance the world socialist revolution. After the death of Mao in 1976, the capitalist rotors who had remained in the party staged a coup under the leadership of the arch revisionist Deng Xiaoping and took over the control of the party under the nominal leadership of Hu Gofeng, a so-called centrist. As Mao had often taught, with political control going over the hands of the revisionist, the socialist base left the hands of the proletariat. At the same time, the leadership of the Albanian Party of Labor switched over to an opportunist line attacking Maoism and projecting Mao as a petite bourgeois revolutionary. Though the Khmer Rouge continued to hold power in Kampuchea, they were waging a constant struggle against the internal and external enemies of the revolution, and were yet to emerge from the economic ravages of war and consolidate their rule when they were defeated by the Soviet-backed Vietnamese army. Thus, there was no country anywhere in the world where the proletariat had consolidated its hold on state power and could play the role of a socialist base for the international proletariat. In the years immediately after Mao's death, there was a considerable amount of ideological confusion in the international communist movement, with the Deng revisionists, through Hugo Feng, attempting to project themselves as upholders of Maoism. In particular, they falsely peddled the revisionist three-world theory as Mao's general line for the international proletariat. Many revolutionary sections accepted these positions, and only after the very openly revisionist history resolution of the CPC in 1981 and the 12th Congress in 1982 did most revolutionary forces throughout the world start coming out openly against Dang revisionism. However, some sections continued to follow the Dangus revisionist line and abandoned Mao's revolutionary teachings. Certain other sections allied themselves with the opportunist attack by the Albanian Party of Labor on Maoism. However, these parties later either disintegrated or openly revealed their revisionist nature. Those that resolutely opposed Dang revisionism and upheld Maoism in practice, however, made considerable advances. Today, these forces form the core of the revolutionary international proletariat. They are leading armed struggles in Peru, the Philippines, Turkey, Nepal, and India. Though these forces are organizationally yet very weak, they continue to grow in strength. The principal source of their growth and strength is the correctness of the ideology of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. The chain of main historical events in the last 20-odd years has confirmed most of the assessments of Maoism. In particular, the collapse of the Soviet Union and its retreat from superpower status in the face of people's struggles, and the serious weakening of the American superpower in the face of the struggles of oppressed peoples of the world, have confirmed the assessment by Mao that these imperialists were only paper tigers who would be taught a lesson by the people. Similarly, Maoism has remained the best tool in the hands of the international proletariat and oppressed peoples to formulate and implement the program for revolution in their own respective countries. It has also had a major influence over the armed struggles for national liberation being waged in various corners of the globe. Though in this period there has not been any major or significant developments in Marxist science and theory, MLM continues to be adaptable to the changing conditions in the world. It yet provides the only scientific and correct theory for the international proletariat. The international communist movement is going through the process of victory, defeat, victory on the road to ultimate victory in the world socialist revolution. For those who would get despondent due to the ups and downs of this process, it would help to remember the understanding given by Mao during the Great Debate and also during the Cultural Revolution. Quote, Even the bourgeois revolution, which replaced one exploiting class by another, had to undergo repeated reversals and witness many struggles. Revolution, then restoration, and then the overthrow of restoration. It took many European countries hundreds of years to complete their bourgeois revolutions from the start of the ideological preparations to the final conquest of state power. Since the proletarian revolution is a revolution aimed at completely ending all systems of exploitation, it is still less permissible to imagine that the exploiting classes will meekly allow the proletariat to deprive them of all their privileges without seeking to restore their rule." Unquote. Temporary defeats are therefore but to be expected on the long and torturous path of the world socialist revolution. The history of 150 years of the development of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, however, has conclusively proved that it is the historical destiny of the doctrine alone to lead and guide the international proletariat to final victory.